Thanks, Craig. Thanks, Craig, and uh, thanks for having me here. It's great to be back in person at an aviation event. I hope, like lots of you, it's, uh, it's been good to catch up with some old friends. So as Craig mentioned, I'm going to talk about what I call the forgotten 99%. Maybe I'm preaching to the choir a little bit here, but if I am, I hope I'll give you a few things to take home with you and spread the word among your instructors, among other pilots in your community, and among your students. And so to start out with, like everything, let's make it personal. So for me, I'm going to go back to my flight training story, which, as you'll quickly see, is not an example of what to do, but perhaps an example of what not to do. So here we are, it's 1996, beautiful Lunkin Airport in Cincinnati, Ohio, sunken Lunkin if you've ever been there, great airport. I was uh, 15 years old, I loved everything about airplanes, and by gosh, I was going to be a pilot. So my mom drove me down to the airport because I didn't have a driver's license, and I walked in the flight school and I said, I want to fly. And what did they say? They said, well, let's go fly, right? The, the flight school did a great job of that. Let's, let's get an intro flight, let's do a discovery flight. Went up in the air, went flying, I was hooked, I knew this was something I had to do. Uh, all good, right? So we started flying, and I had some goals. I was, uh, you know, an ambitious little guy, and I wanted to solo at 16, because I'd heard that was sort of the, the cool thing to do, and I wanted to get my private at 17, but let's be honest, what I really wanted to do was take my girlfriend for a flight, because I knew I was going to be the coolest guy in high school if I could do that. Well, check, check, check. I sold it at 16. I got my private at 17. I took my girlfriend for a flight. She married me 25 years later. We have two kids. Life is great, right? End of presentation. Thanks for attending. <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> Minor detail, it did take me two years to get my private certificate. I did change instructors a few times. I almost quit a couple times. I had lots of frustrations, some false starts. Uh, it was anything but smooth, and I'm sure many of you in this room here have similar stories either from you personally or from a student. I realized about halfway through that, hi, some people seems like they get their license in less than two years. That's interesting. I wonder maybe if I'm doing some things wrong. Well, yeah, I was doing a lot wrong. Uh, in a broad sense, my mistake was my focus was too narrow. I was focused on flying. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a pilot, so I wanted to fly. I didn't fly often enough, which I'll talk about here in a minute. There was no syllabus, which may be shocking for some of you in this room who are the elite of flight training, but uh, it's, a, it's a reality. Maybe it's less of a reality today than 25 years ago, but I really didn't have a syllabus. Didn't have a video course or homework. Uh, I think I had a test prep book I used one weekend to cram for the written. And as I mentioned there, that written test was a box to check. I certainly wasn't going to learn anything because of the written. That was just memorize some silly questions and move on. So I was very focused on achieving a goal and not really how I got there. And so here's an example of what my schedule looked like. You know, I had school during the week, I played sports, so I went to school and I went to football practice and I didn't really have time to fly during the week. But I had weekends, so I was going to fly every single weekend. I was going to devote at least four, week, four days a month to flying, this was going to be my focus. Well, I live in Ohio. You may know what happens in Ohio between about October 1st and April 1st. The gray descends in the town, and when it's not 502, it's uh, 25 knots of wind, always at a crosswind. So what really happened was that. I would cancel a couple lessons because of weather. I would cancel a lesson because an airplane was down for 100 hour. I would cancel a lesson because my flight instructor was out of town. So all of a sudden, out of 30 days in a month, I might commit flight training once, which, as all of you know, is a terrible way to learn anything. That one lesson I did have, all we did was review what I had forgotten from the last lesson. There was no sense of progress. There was no moving forward. Again, I didn't have a syllabus to even know where I was. I didn't really have a course to fall back on to fill in the gaps. So this was basically my flying experience for much of my initial flight training. Not a good way to learn. And so about halfway through this, I was uh, sitting with a group of pilots at the airport, complaining, honestly, just about how, gosh, I can never fly. You know, the weather's bad. The airplane's down. I just I haven't logged any time. Uh, and, and isn't this frustrating? How do you guys do it? And a, a person who looked like John Wayne to me. I thought he had a million hours and had seen everything and ate gravel for breakfast and flew DC-3s. 
Uh, he, I realize now I think he was maybe 30, and maybe he had about 1,200 hours. <laughs> But for me at the time, he looked like, you know, John Wayne, uh, uh, just like that. And after I'd been kind of whining for a little bit, uh, he, he said something really, even at a, as a 15, I think I was 16 at the time, as a 16-year-old, that really hit home. He said, yeah, that's, that's great. Uh, it sounds like you, you love flying, and uh, sorry you don't get to fly a whole lot. What about the other 99% of your time? What are you doing with that? Because I, I hope you don't think being a pilot is just about what you do in the left seat and the time that goes in your logbook. And even for kind of a cocky 16-year-old, I knew that that was probably a deep thought that I should think about. What about that 99% time? Well, of course, as a smart 16-year-old, I said, well, let's check that math there, Grandpa. Uh, you know, 99%, I don't have that much time. You know, well, maybe. So you can see some of my math here. Maybe it takes you six months to learn to fly. Most people, somewhere between 40 and 70 hours to get that private certificate. For me, it was two years. So my math is, let's give myself 14 waking hours per day. That's over 10,000 hours. Even if you say it's gonna take 70 hours, it's less than 1%. Here's your graph. There's me sleeping, something you wanna do. There's me not in an airplane, but awake. And there's me in the airplane, you probably can't see it, but it's right there. This is the time that a lot of us spend talking about. We optimize for it, we log it, we focus on it, and we should, it's important. You have to fly, you have to manipulate the controls to be a pilot. It's expensive, we should make the most out of it. So I'm not here to tell you that flying's not important, far from it. All I wanna suggest to you is that maybe this giant red chunk here could get a little more attention from all of us, flight instructors, flight schools, students, flight training industry at large. There's a lot of time there. And there's a lot of time that at least for me as a student pilot, I did not focus on. I did not get my money's worth from. So that's the 99% uh, I'm talking about here. And as I will suggest to you, we need to focus on that. There's a lot to be done there. So fast forward 10 years, I did eventually power through, got my private certificate, got my instrument rating, multi-engine, all that. I was officially smitten with airplanes. I knew that this was what I wanted to do. And so as Craig mentioned, I ended up at a Sporties in Cincinnati. And I realized quickly that things were a little different there, that a lot of flight students managed to get their certificate in three, four months, not two years. I wasn't aware of many dropouts. It seemed like everybody that started ended up finishing. It seemed like people were really happy. So as I worked there some more and moved on to different parts of the organization, I started working with our educational team at Sporties Academy. Uh, Brett Kobe, Eric Radke, two of my colleagues who really lead that group are here. And one of the things that they have built in particular over the last 10 years is this flight training experience uh, with home study courses, our pilot training courses. And what I realized is that now I was gonna be part of the solution to this. And so that hopefully no other student pilot did what I did, which was waste all that time outside of the airplane. Started out 61 years ago with Sporties, Hal Shevers founded Sporties as a flight instructor, doing three-day ground school, so it's really in our DNA. Uh, it was DVDs when I got there, now it's online courses and it's apps. And here's the good news. Online life is normal. That's never been more true than now. You don't have to read all these numbers, but this is the age of student pilots in 2020. And I'll summarize for you by saying that 46% were under 30 years old. 73% were under 40 years old. And I would suggest on a career pilot track, somebody who's gonna be accelerated going to the airlines, it's probably even younger, right? Well, I'm older than both those categories. And in high school, I had a laptop and this fancy thing called Netscape that let me get on the internet. So the huge majority of student pilots we all deal with have grown up with this, right? There's nothing different here, there's nothing abnormal. Certainly the last couple years with COVID, even more people have gotten used to life being online. So living life online, learning online, tools online or on your phone are completely normal. When I first started working at Sporties about 20 years ago, I had some convincing to do that, well, what's a DVD player? Why do I need a DVD to watch a video? We don't even have to talk about that now, right? Everybody here has a smartphone. Everybody here is used to this. So that's good, and that's a major help for all of us. There is a downside, though, to this online life, as I'm sure many of you are aware of, 
And I can summarize it with this. Anybody familiar with this video that's been making the rounds the last couple months, right? A, a YouTuber uh, had a suspiciously timed engine failure uh, over a remote part of the US West and decided, contrary to every checklist and training I've ever seen, that the right answer was to bail out of the airplane, um, which is obviously a terrible idea, and he has come in for plenty of uh, ridicule, really, for it. So the problem, obviously, is everybody's living life online. This is great. This can fill in that 99% time. However, what are you paying attention to, right? Is it helpful or is it hurtful? This is an extreme example, but there's plenty of other stuff. I'm sure you all have examples you can think of. Um, you know, anybody with a GoPro can make a video. I've seen some good ones on how to do uh, steep turns that are exactly contrary to everything we would teach in our flight school. So you really have to be careful. It's not enough just to say, uh, hey, we can't fly today. Go watch some YouTube. Good luck. That's not enough, obviously. And I thought this was an interesting way of sort of summarizing it. This is a, a writer. David Perel summed it up. We're in a world of abundance with the internet, obviously. And he says, information abundance, like all markets of abundance, is bad for the average person, but great for a small number of people. And this chart's kind of a good example. The old sort of normal bell curve distribution there in gray and the new one in purple. And the point is, the median shifts towards worse. The average video online is terrible probably worse than before because there are no gatekeepers and there's no publisher to keep you from writing a bad book or whatever it might be. However, if you do your homework and if you really focus on it, you can get better stuff than ever before. So it is possible both to have a terrible experience with online tools and it's also possible to have an exceptional experience. And unfortunately, there's not a lot in the middle. It seems to swing to both sides. Instead of this bell curve distribution, it's a bimodal distribution. So, that's, I think, a good way of visualizing what we're up against. Yes, use online tools. However, let's be careful about what we're using. Now, I'm obviously going to get up here and tell you why Sporties is great, but more importantly than that, let's think about some ways to evaluate what would be helpful for a student. I'm, I will illustrate with Sporties, but I think this applies to plenty of other things, and I'm going to show you some other tools just beyond what we do. Five main pillars I think about in what we do. First is go beyond YouTube. YouTube is great. I think it's fantastic for our industry. It's, it inspires people. It is a great introduction. There are some people doing some wonderful things out there. However, a true course, I think, true video training, you got to start with the ACS. you got to start with flight school. We base all of our uh, segments on what we do in our flight school. We run a very busy flight school like many of you. We're training students. And so the goal here is to complement flight training. So we focus on the ACS. We focus on not just recording a flight that you could see from the left seat, but using multiple cameras, using graphics. Here's a great example. We all teach this, right? What does a normal approach look like? How do I know if I'm high or low? It's pretty hard in the moment with the cockpit bouncing around and with bugs all over the windshield to really internalize that. You might have two or three seconds where you get that as a student pilot. Here's an example where I can see it in, uh, in, in really stark relief, and I can really pause it and internalize that. So we really try to go beyond just putting the GoPro in the, in the cockpit and going flying. Animations are a big part of what we do, trying to really explode that engine. How does a piston go up and down? You can't tell by looking at an O320. You want to go inside of it and see how that works. And then we really take pride at Sporties and not just focusing on passing the test, uh, but safe flying. That's what it's about, safe and rewarding career. So video, amazing. Uh, the latest cameras, 4K, makes it so much easier. We're not lugging giant production cameras in the cockpit anymore. But those are tools. You have to use those. It's not just enough to start filming. Second, and I, I feel so strongly about this one, because boy, did I make this mistake as a, as a student, go beyond the written test. You know, what I tell a lot of student pilots is relax about the written test. You all, the stats are public, right? The FAA publishes this. Over 85% of student pilots last year passed their private pilot written. Over 90% passed the instrument written, and all we ever hear about is how the instrument is impossible. If you do your homework, you're going to pass the written test. So yes, prepare for it. And yes, we have tons of tools in our course to study the questions, to take practice tests, to use artificial intelligence to drill down in the parts you need. That's great. But let's go beyond that. 
So for us, that means flight maneuvers guide, showing each of those maneuvers, not just the ACS standards, but what that looks like, a checklist for success. That means documents. Yes, it's still okay to read some books in 2022, airplane flying handbook, all those other tools. Flashcards, I know for me, kind of the trap was the oral exam. I was all geared up for the written test, and I knew this check ride was sort of where it all happened. And I think about two weeks before my check ride, somebody said, oh, by the way, uh, you know, here's this blue book of the oral exam. You ought to study that because you're going to have to do an interview with the examiner. Where did that come from? Uh, and I think it's often overlooked. That oral, depending on your examiner, uh, if you had the examiner I had for my multi-engine course, uh, that's a five-hour ordeal. So uh, we have a lot of flashcards we build in there to help not just memorize test questions, but really to understand uh, systems, regulations, uh, and those kind of things that seem to come up there. Syllabus, we include a complete lesson-by-lesson -lesson syllabus based in our 141 flight school. That is something I dearly would have liked to have as a flight student, so I know that, hey, next time, we're gonna work on crosswind landings, and maybe I should review the video segment on crosswind landings, and maybe I should read the airplane flying handbook segment on crosswind landings, and I should look at the maneuver on crosswind landings so I know what I'm doing. It sounds obvious, but I'm shocked at how many student pilots don't do this. You show up to the airport and you say, well, what's today? Well, today we're gonna do turns around a point. Wouldn't it be helpful if you had prepared ahead of time so that you knew what that was all about and you could go put it into practice in the aircraft instead of having to learn it from scratch? And then we also have an ACS study guide so you can drill down task by task in the ACS which you're gonna be tested on. Something we've really invested in over the last five years is learn everywhere. If we're gonna take advantage of that 99% time outside of the airplane, we're all busy, that means everywhere. That does not mean sitting at home necessarily in front of a TV for five hours a day. People are on the go. So yes, our course available online. Full iOS app for uh, iPad and iPhone, all the features work there. Full Android app for tablets and phones, all the features work there. We've added smart TVs this past year. We have our app now working on Apple TV, Roku, Android TV, Fire TV, Chromecast. If you have a TV, you can run it. That's a really good way to watch some of the big video pieces as well. Recently, we've added audio. So if you're on the treadmill and you want to listen to it, you can do that. We added CarPlay. So if you're in the car driving to work, instead of a podcast, you can listen to this. It may seem like overkill, but if we're serious about that 99% time, it has to be available everywhere you are. And students continually tell us, I will train anywhere I have five minutes. If I'm waiting in line at Starbucks for coffee, I can do a review quiz. So that's really been one of our focuses, is everywhere. It's also important, I think, to acknowledge that we're not going to offer everything. And so we like to plug into other tools. A lot of people in this room today uh, participate in some of the things we do at Sporties. Redbird Gift, we have an outline at the beginning of our training course outline that syncs up with that. AOPA's new flight training advantage, which you can hear about here today, uh, we connect with that. We've been great to work with that crew to make sure that the tools are integrated so that not everything's siloed. You use an AOPA flight training advantage in your flight school? Great. You use in Sporty's course? Great. Let's put those together so that they work together. For flight logbook, it's a simple thing, but I want to log my endorsement for the knowledge test. Well, I use a digital logbook, so I should be able to log it in my logbook. Flight Schedule Pro. We integrate with that as well. So uh, we're really serious about connecting our platform with other uh, people who are trying to make the flight training experience better. And then the most important one and the most recent work we've done is that student instructor connection. Uh, it's really important to have that connection. I did not have it the first time my flight instructor left to get a flying job. Basically, we started over, hey, uh, where are you? What was the last lesson you did? there's a better way. So we have just launched recently our new CFI portal. The best thing for all of you is it's free, absolutely free, not like credit card trial free, it's free. If you're an active flight instructor, go to sporties.com slash CFI and you can check it out. Uh, but it allows you to create class rosters. You, a student can share their progress in the course. You can review the course. So if the student's gonna do crosswind landings, you can watch the video segment on crosswind landings. Uh, you can access an, our endorsement guide. You can manage your documents. If you have a standard operating procedures document, you can upload it here and share it. Lesson plan guides are there. So check it out. Uh, but also, I think the big picture there is that connection. Have something that provides continuity between you and your students. 
You may not think it's as important, but I can tell you from a student standpoint, it's very, very important to know where they are and to feel like they're connected. All right, so hopefully I've given you the pitch on what we're doing at Sporties. I do think it's really, really important, and we see it every day in our flight school. Uh, as I said, our, our dropout rate is essentially zero. There are other tools, though. Redbird, the whole point of this conference, right? Flight simulators are a great 99% tool, a great way to use that time when the weather's bad, the airplane's down for maintenance. Uh, I think one of the things Redbird has been great about is trying to convince flight schools and students to use these as tools, right? It's easy to kind of goof off in a flight simulator, especially maybe a home flight simulator like you see here. If you approach it seriously, if it is supported by the flight school or the flight instructor, if there is a real lesson plan every time you get in the sim, it's a tremendous way to fill in the gaps. I know I would have loved to have this as a student pilot. Uh, the, the most basic thing that I never appreciated about sims was just cockpit flows. You know, yeah, you may not learn how to do a crosswind landing perfectly in a small non-motion sim, but there is so much you can learn just running the checklist. What do I, why do I turn on you know, this switch after that switch? What is my flow? What is the layout of the aircraft panel? So even if you don't believe that uh, you know, sims are the future of flight training, I think you'd be surprised at what they can do for a new pilot. We tend to overlook all the things we know uh, that a student pilot sometimes can have real stress about. And here's another good news for the simulator users here, which was shared uh, yesterday with Redbird from their survey. Students are more enthusiastic about simulators than all of us. You can look at you know, instrument training there in the second column, pretty obvious, I think most people think of sims as being very good for instrument flying. But look at the left side under sport and private pilot training, even multi-engine training. Students are more enthusiastic about sims than most people in the flight training community, the professionals. Now, maybe we have a difference of opinion about it, but I think we should give serious consideration to what the students are trying to tell us there and the value of a simulator in their training experience. So 99% time, it's good for everybody, I think. It's good for the student. As I mentioned, you can maintain momentum. If you miss a lesson, you can still be progressing forward. It's more efficient in the airplane. As I mentioned, if you show up to a lesson ready to train, knowing what you're going to cover, you have your syllabus, you've reviewed the materials, it's a much more powerful one hour in the airplane, I think. Easier CFI handoffs, like I mentioned, it, it happens. Flight instructors leave, they, especially in this market. They get jobs. It's much easier to hand off if you have a syllabus and a training program, and you can say, I'm at lesson 26, and I just watched the video for lesson 27. Let's go fly tomorrow. And not to be overlooked, safer pilots, which is really what we're all about here, right? We want to make safe, successful pilots. So here's an example. This was my calendar as a, uh, a student pilot where I got weathered out or canceled because of maintenance, and I had one aviation interaction per month. If I take advantage of my 99% time, I could easily do that. I could get some aviation fix multiple times per week, whether it's watching a course online, flying a simulator, many of the other tools that are available. That's a dramatic increase in what you're doing with flight training. It's also good for the flight school. This is not all charity on our part. There are many uh, advantages for the flight school. You can sell the course. You can be a sporties dealer and sell our course. You can sell someone else's course, make a little money there. Obviously, you can rent a simulator, make some money on that. But I would encourage you to think about the bigger picture, which is customer retention and lifetime value. So I work in marketing at sporties. I'm the person you can blame for the catalog that shows up at your house every two weeks. I promise it's not that often. But what we look at and what any good marketer looks at is not just the person that came in today and transacted business with me. You look at their lifetime value. I look at Joe Smith and what is Joe going to be worth to me over the lifetime of his business relationship with me. And that is incredibly important in a business like flight training where they're coming back again and again and again. This is not one and done. This is not a gas station where they fill up their tank and move on. If we can create student pilots who progress and achieve their goals, that is worth all kinds of investment up front. That is worth more than any minor modification uh, to some uh, efficiency on an individual lesson. So I really think that's the biggest payback for the flight school. If you increase uh, the completion rate for your students, if you have happier customers, they talk about it, they're your best advertising, that is the payback. And then of course, keep saying it, safer pilots. If we crank out better pilots, that's better for everybody. 
So here's that calendar again, maybe from the flight school standpoint. Yeah, you're not gonna monetize every last one of those moments, but there could be the option to sell them a course, to log some time uh, in a flight simulator, to do a ground lesson with a student. So just because the flight lesson got canceled, that does not mean you're done providing training for the student. Now I do wanna mention before moving on, this is not all about technology, it's not all about apps and flight simulators, right? There is great value in people in analog things. Ground lessons are great. I think we all learned over the last couple of years that you can do a decent ground lesson over FaceTime or Zoom. So even if you can't get instructor and student together, don't overlook that option. There are uh, some great tools. We're gonna to be building out with our Sporties courseware over the next year or so to really build into that so you can use those type of FaceTime ground lessons more effectively. Aviation magazines, podcasts, you know, for me as a student, uh, reading aviation magazines was probably the only thing I did 99% time. I do think there's value there. Talk to other pilots, go to airport events. This is a great picture of some guys at Mallory Airport down in West Virginia. There is a lot of knowledge stored in those brains. So uh, and that can be very intimidating for a new pilot, but I encourage you to tell your students about the value that is there. All right, I wanna talk about one other 99% option out there. And this is beyond the check ride. I know I was very goal oriented. Solo the airplane, pass the written, pass the check ride, throw away that textbook and fly. And I think a lot of people tend to have that mindset. But a lot of what we're talking about here is going beyond just that goal. So another piece of math for you. If you're training a future airline pilot today, they could easily log 20,000 hours in a career, right? If they start out and fly their whole career, Let's say 250 hours of training even. Build their time, get their commercial. Same bar graph here, right? Initial training, time building. Almost 99% of your time spent as a pilot will be after that check ride. Does anybody think you have it all figured out after that first check ride? Obviously not. But again, a lot of times when we talk about training, we talk about that initial 70 hours, 100 hours, 250 hours. There's another 99% that is after that check ride. Your flying career after your training. And part of the reason this matters is change. Change is constant, right? If you're a CFI, this may be a snapshot of your career. You learn to fly in something like that. I learned to fly in something not that different from that. You know, an ADF was, I think, the fanciest thing in there. And now you're flight instructing in this. You didn't learn how to do that in your first 250 hours. It didn't exist. Ask rusty pilots. We see this all the time at Sporty. Somebody comes in who hasn't logged any time in 15 years. And they come in and they say, wow, what, what's, what's a Garmin G5? What's four flight? You know, the last I knew, I had a sectional chart and a plotter. Seems like a small thing to us maybe, but it's a major change. Change is also never ending. As Pete mentioned earlier today, Everything we know about propulsion is gonna change, I think, in the next 10, 15 years. So all the things we know about an O320 uh, that may be so valuable in ground school today are not gonna be as meaningful when we're talking about electric motors in the future. So we have to acknowledge that change is never gonna stop. Even in aviation, which seems sometimes so stuck in the past, so slow moving, there's plenty of change for us to contend with. I also think it's important to realize that it's really on us as pilots to affect this safety record. The number one thing I think we can do for aviation to succeed is to be safer. We tend to, because we have made the decision to be in this industry, we have done the math and we are convinced that aviation can be a safe thing and it absolutely can be. But I think we tend to overlook sometimes to the non-flying public how important safety still is. And safety, as we all know, still tends to come down to the pilot. Yes, it's complicated, equipment breaks, uh, you know, plenty of things can go wrong. But there's no doubt that the key to safety, especially in general aviation, is the person sitting in the left seat. So it's on us to drive safety. It's also on us here, even if you have thousands and thousands of hours. Here's some safety stats. Accidents, private pilots account for 47%, commercial for 24, ATPs for 15. So you know, I've got an ATP, I've got 4,000 hours. Obviously, I'm not gonna crash. Well, not according to the statistics. The one that gets me is 55% of accidents had an IFR pilot on board. Again, we tend to think, well, it's only those VFR pilots and they stumble into the clouds and crash. Not according to the stats, and this is from AOPA Air Safety Institute, which has 
as you probably know, some fantastic data on this. It is on all of us to commit to lifelong learning because you never do graduate. You're never over the hump and you, well, now I'm safe. Somebody I had the pleasure to work with for many years, Richard Collins, great writer. And he always said, he wrote a book on this. It's only the next hour that counts. Anytime you'd ask him, how many hours do you have? He'd say, well, I kind of quit counting at 20,000, but it doesn't matter because it's only the next hour that counts. Cliche, but very, very true. And I think the stats bear this out. So I always tell people when they're interested in becoming a pilot and they say, hey, I, I, wanna, I wanna get my certificate, I wanna get my pilot's license. I always try to quickly convince them that being a pilot is a lifestyle, not a license. It's not a scuba weekend where you check the box. If you're gonna be a pilot and really fly, it has gotta be part of your lifestyle. It's not riding the bike. You're not done once you learn it. And I think this is normal now more than it maybe used to be. Most jobs require lifelong learning. Most jobs are not something you get a certificate in college or high school for and never learn again. Most jobs are gonna require you to essentially retrain every five to 10 years. I also think during the pandemic, we've seen even more of this at a cultural level. Anybody else see any of these masterclass ads over the last two years online? I, I feel like they were stalking me, right? I, Steph Curry wanted to teach me how to shoot threes, which sounds great, but I'm not sure how, my, how, how that's gonna help. But I think people are used to this, right? They're, they're aware that modern life requires lifelong learning. So I think we have an audience that is up for this, but we need to reinforce that flying is part of this. Flying is not something you're ever done with learning. So back to sporties, what we're doing there to commit to that is lifetime free updates with our course. You buy our learn to fly course or instrument rating course, you own it forever. There's no subscription or upgrade fees. We update it every year, multiple times per year. You get those updates for free because we want you to continue to use it. It's not a product you use to pass your test and then move on. It is something you should use continually to stay current, to be your best. We also add new courses every year. We just launched a tailwheel course with Patty Wagstaff. Uh, we're always adding new courses to, to help you advance your skills and go beyond the basics. And to do that, we've partnered with some people. We've partnered with Garmin on avionics training. As I mentioned, we've partnered with Patty Wagstaff now on two courses. We're gonna continue to do that. We want our pilot training apps to be the place where you can continue to improve your skills as a pilot far beyond your check ride. Back to simulators, another 99% tool that comes into play here. Obviously a fantastic tool for continuing your learning. For me, the two most important things, once you've got some time in a simulator that I get value out of, of is instrument scan, just the, the, the mental exercise of keeping that scan sharp is so valuable in the simulator to me. And then using your EFB app, which is something I really didn't appreciate until recently, but in most of these simulators, even down to Microsoft Flight Simulator, you can pair your app up with your computer and use your ForeFlight or Garmin Pilot just like you're flying in the airplane. This is a great way to stay proficient on that, which I know I see a lot of pilots using about 2% of the app they fly with. And a simulator is a fantastic way to really learn the ins and outs of your app and stay current on it. So if you're if your students think of simulators as just a way to practice maneuvers, I'd encourage you to tell them to look beyond that. Some other great tools, Cloud Ahoy, who's here you can hear from, ForeFlight, who's here you'll talk to, GoPro, it's never been easier to record your flight and then play it back. And I think this is really great for established pilots because especially if you've got some time, it can be a little humbling to go fly with a flight instructor, right? And you go get your flight review and ah, you know, I'm, kinda, I'm supposed to be the person that has it all figured out and now I've gotta go put myself under the microscope. Well, this is a good way to do it in the privacy of your home and if you have a terrible flight, you could play it back in four flight and say, wow, look at that, look at that altitude excursion or look at that poor airspeed control or look how terrible that steep turn was. I really think this is an underused feature in most modern pilots toolboxes. It is so easy, even a, a basic track log playback in four flight is great. Expor, export it to Cloud Ahoy, you can really go to the next level. Um, and I think this is something we need to be telling flight students early on so that they understand these are the tools they can use without a flight instructor. Go fly your own flight. You don't need to have somebody sitting in the right seat, but it takes the emotion out of it, you know? Was that steep turn good? Well, the facts are right there. That's not a, something for me to interpret. It's right there in the app. I also think it's very, very important to find a mentor. I know I had many mentors uh, as I went up the, the ladder in aviation. None of them were official mentors. None of them were people I sat down with and said, will you please be my mentor? 
right? I don't think most people operate that way. But it's very important to find that person, and it may change throughout your career. Um, but I think if you as a flight instructor can connect a student with a mentor, maybe it's you, but maybe it's not, I think this is one of the best ways to instill that lifelong learning. Uh, I do think it doesn't have to be a flight instructor. One of my best mentors ever was a, a pilot who flew checks at night, back when that was a thing, and he flew checks in the nastiest Baron I'd ever seen. But when I was working on my instrument rating, he was a tremendous source of uh, knowledge, of inspiration. I learned a lot from him. And he wasn't a flight instructor, so he wasn't what you would consider maybe at first glance to be a great mentor, uh, but he was perfect. But I do think it's great to have an in-person connection. So maybe you can use an online tool. Maybe you find somebody on Facebook. That's great. But I would encourage you to help that student find a mentor in person. Uh, there's a lot, to be, a lot to be found there. What we're really after is fighting complacency, right? We don't want this view in the cockpit, unless it's sanctioned in-flight nap. And to me, the way I think about this is you should feel uncomfortable at least once a year. And some people will kind of look at me strange when I say that maybe. And I'm not saying go out and be a daredevil. But if you've been flying 365 days and you never once felt like you were outside your comfort zone, I think you haven't pushed yourself enough. So maybe that means earning a new rating. This is a great way. For years, I uh, set a goal that I was going to earn a new rating instead of doing a flight review. Even if it's just a tailwheel checkout, this is a great thing to do. Check out a new airplane. That may not be a new rating, but that's a great way to kind of go back to the fundamentals of learning how to fly and airspeed control and aircraft command. Take a long trip. I find even the simplest VFR trip, if I go 1,500 miles and make multiple stops, I learn so much from that experience. When you get outside of your home airspace, when you deal with new terrain, new weather, new airspace, new controller accents, that can be so valuable. And again, the mentor thing. Because the best thing I learned from this guy who flew checks is he went flying with me a few times. And we specifically flew on days that I would not have gone by myself. And I look back now and I realize there's nothing unsafe about it. It just wasn't within my comfort zone. And he said, oh, we're going to go flying. You'll see this. It's, it's going to be OK. And I'm obviously, I'm here. If something goes wrong, this guy could, could handle it. And I was uncomfortable on a couple of those flights. And I was really nervous uh, as we lined up for takeoff there. But I learned so much from those. And I, I worry sometimes that in our effort to instill safety, 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 sometimes we don't instill the message that you sometimes have to push yourself to expand that envelope. So uh, you know, I, I always tell people who are learning to fly, maybe they've got a private certificate, and they're in that sort of zone of, what do I do now? You know, I've got my license, but I don't really feel comfortable taking the family on a long trip. Go find somebody who will fly with you on marginal days. You know that crosswind's 15 gusts to 20? Go fly with somebody and understand what that feels like. Or, you know, there's a, there's a 500 foot thick cloud deck. There might be ice in there. I'm not sure. Let's go flying and see what it looks like. Obviously, you need discretion here, right? We don't want to encourage people to do anything unsafe, but I do think we want to encourage people to go beyond their comfort zone. So, the goal, as a reminder, right? What are we here for? More efficient training. It is expensive, so if we can use that 99% time to get people through faster, that's good. Higher quality, that's going to be a better experience for everybody. More fun. You know, if you're succeeding, it's more fun. If I'm soloing when I want to, if I'm getting my certificate in 45 hours instead of 90 hours, that's more fun. And then, again, safer pilots. That's really what it all comes back to. I'll leave you with this because I think it's worth reminding where we are in the industry. Pete talked about the exciting time we are with a lot of the developments in new aircraft. For all of us in the flight training business, we're a very exciting time too because we are training the next generation of pilots. And after that little COVID pause, this is airline pilot hiring trends from FAPA, it's going up, up, up and to the right. So we are all training a huge cadre of pilots that are going to be powering our aviation industry over the next few decades. So. In many ways, there's never been a better time to be in flight training. We have these new modern tools. We have a growing student population. I think we have a great chance to set a safety culture for the next few decades. Thank you very much.